The next business of the House is the election of a Speaker. Is there a nomination? The member for Macquarie. Madam Clerk, I move that the member for Oxley, Milton Dick, take the chair of this House as Speaker of the Parliament. Yeah. I arrived in this place at the same time as the member for Oxley in 2016. Our friendship was not hindered by the fact that we come from different states, we come from different parts of the Labor Party, and we represent very different constituencies. In fact, our differences have helped. My respect and affection for the member for Oxley is based on what I have come to know of him in those six years. He is a generous soul, an attribute very welcome in this place, and would stand him in good place from that chair. He is thoughtful, reasonable and listens carefully, all essential speaker skills. He speaks with care, with warmth and with authority. What many in this place may not know is his prodigious memory for numbers, particularly political numbers. <laughs> and in fact, he knows percentages in my seat better than I do. <laughs> Admittedly, they were at times very small numbers to recall. <laughs> but that will also stand him in good stead if he were elected Speaker of this place. One thing we have in common is a commitment to educating school students in our democracy, a commitment shared by a previous Speaker, the former member for Casey. And what better role to do that from than the Speaker's chair? I know the member for Oxley would bring to the role of Speaker an ability to make the Parliament a more welcome and diverse place to visit and experience. From the start of his time here, he showed a deep interest in the rules of this place. I recall the odd misstep in his early years that saw him ejected from this place, but, but he learned from those experiences and has worked tirelessly to improve the tone of this place. Not only has he been a member of the Speaker's panel, but as Deputy Chair of the Procedures Committee for six years, he's helped rewrite and recommend changes to the standing orders alongside the member for Bonner. Similarly, the member for Oxley has been a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters for the, all of that time, continuing a deep commitment to maintaining the integrity of domestic, uh, of domestic, of democratic institutions and domestic democratic institutions, which he pursued long before arriving in Canberra. While he's been well able to engage in vigorous debate in this chamber, I know from my discussions the deep commitment he has to improving the tone, temperament and tenor of this place. I hope that all of us in this House will be willing to join him on a journey that he would lead us on as the Speaker of the 33rd Parliament. Oh, I should, I actually, I think I'm getting my numbers wrong there, Milton. <laughs> as the 33rd Speaker of the Parliament, you can see why I need him for the numbers. <laughs> respect is never just given, it's earned, and I already see the respect with which the member for Oxley's contributions from the floor have been received, and I have no doubt that he would earn this House's respect in his role as Speaker. So it is with great honour that I nominate the member for Oxley, Milton Dick, to be the Speaker of the Parliament. Yeah. Is the motion seconded? The member for Bendigo. Thank you. It is my privilege to second the nomination of my good friend, the member for Oxley, for the role of Speaker. I have known the member for Oxley for almost 25 years. Yes, we were members of Young Labor. Back then I was loud, ranting and protesting, as the left usually does, and the member for Oxley was calm, considered and focused. Some may say what's changed. The member for Oxley is still calm, considered and focused on solutions. The member for Oxley has the skills and the attributes required to be the role of speaker. He is committed to listening to different colleagues for the best possible outcome. No doubt something that he learnt from his late parents. His father, Alan, who served in the Navy in World War II and then after owned a small business, and his mum, Joan, a caring nurse and midwife who taught their three children service before others. 
Members of his family are gathered here today in the gallery, five strong women, sister and cousins, cousins who are more like sisters. And I am told he's the glue that keeps everyone connected. Everyone in this place who knows the member for Oxley knows this to be true. If you've worked with him on a committee or a delegation, you would know that he is inclusive and reaches out across the party spectrum to find common ground or just catch up for a cup of coffee. The member for Oxley has the experience for the role of speaker. Before his time in this place, he was a Brisbane City Councillor, do not hold that against him, for eight years before becoming the member for Oxley, which he has proudly served for six. He has served on the speaker's panel and various committees with distinction and a work ethic that he will bring to the role of speaker. The member for Oxley embodies what it means to be a member of the House of Representatives. He is a grassroots, hard-working local MP. He is a trade unionist. When he is in his electorate, you will find him at a mobile office, a workplace, a local community, faith or multicultural event. The Oxley electorate is a diverse community of around 50,000 people born overseas. Anyone who follows his socials know how important multiculturalism is to him, and he's not afraid to don on the culturally appropriate clothing for any occasion if asked. <laughs> During the Queensland floods and the recovery, he was there for his community, assisting on the ground with the recovery effort and cleanup. And it is hard to find a Facebook post of the, of the member for Oxley where he's not covered in head to toe in mud. The member for Oxley is an organiser, appointed to the very important role of secretary of the Waza Thursday night dinner. Colleagues, I can assure you he was, his ability to coordinate, accommodate and manage the many who attended that dinner puts the member for Oxley in good stead for this role. He was not afraid to sit anyone down who spoke for too long at these dinners or eject anyone who was being unparliamentary. He will be a great speaker in the traditions of this place. The member for Oxley will serve the parliament in a manner that we and the Australian people will all be proud of. I proudly second the motion. Does the member for Kennedy wish to speak the on clerk, this motion? I'd like to speak in favour of. Member for Kennedy. Um, speaking uh, in favour of Milton Dick. Um, obviously, I came out of uh, Queensland politics, where we ruled happily for 30 or 40 years, um, so uh, we were knocked off. And he was one of the people responsible for it. So it's a bit of a turnaround. Me, me, me. I'm supporting him here today. Um, Bill Hayden said, "If you want a future in politics," and uh, the previous speakers made comment about this. If you want a future in politics. Look forward to 10,000 fates worse than death. Um, 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 he ran the ALP in Queensland, and a lot of people would disagree with that. Probably Milton would disagree with that. He ran the ALP in Queensland, and uh, I think played a major part in the moulding on to office for most of the time since we've had a Lighten government in 1990, when the Alpha government fell in 1990. Um, the only bigger part played in that, of course, was the incompetence of the LNP, but I don't want to bring up politics. Um, no, um, surely, surely wouldn't do that. Uh, um, uh, but I would like to mention, I would like to mention, like all of the old families in Queensland, uh, of which my family is one, uh, all the people that go way back, um, they'll come from Gympie or mostly from Charters Towers, because we're a gold rush country. Our population came here during the gold rushes, and they were the two great gold rush cities outside of Ballarat and Bendigo, of course. Um, but uh, I would like to comment upon this, if, if the, the, uh, the House would give me uh, permission, because it's a story that so many other families here would share. My great-great-grandmother, his great-great-grandmother, a widow, arrived in Charters Towers around 1880. That's been a bit of one-upmanship, because my mob arrived in 1881. I think he's been a bit sneaky there. Um, I, I, from Scotland looking for gold with her five children and my great-grandfather, Joseph 
Allen, who married Miss Georgina Goff, my best mate, is a Goff from Charters Towers. So we were those towns. It always remains the same. The Allens lived. Um, they attended Richmond Hill State School. My great grandmother's family, the Goffs, built the Excelsior Hotel and the theatre in Charters Towers, and it's still standing there today. Um, the business people in Charters Towers, namely the Goffs, the Aridus, my family, um, they backed and threw all of their weight behind the fledgling labour movement. Cynics would say, well, the more money in the workers' pocket, the more money in my shop. But I don't think that's a fair comment. And uh, um, so I greatly uh, pay tribute to the history of his family uh, as a great Australian contributing family, not only in business, but also in what needed to be done where um, over 100 people died in two mining accidents in the electorate I represent, 72 at Mount Mulligan and 23 in Charters Towers. And uh, to stand up for those people, business people to stand up for those people, was a wonderful thing. And uh, Milton has carried on that tradition. And he has carried on that tradition, and I end on this note, that it was announced that Mount Isa was going to close with it, the fertiliser plant, and this nation would lose about $6 billion a year in income. It was an official announcement. It was closing. Now, the two people responsible for not closing, and I won't going to go into the details of it, were Milton Dick and Tony McGrady, who's a great enemy of mine, and I'm a great enemy of his. <laughs> but, but, but I approached those two people, and they did the job, and that $6,000 um, million a year was rescued for our nation, and 2,000 jobs in Townsville, and 2,000 jobs in Mount Isa were rescued as well. So I pay him a very fine tribute, and I want to put that on public record. Um, very few people in this place will ever achieve what those two gentlemen achieved uh, in that historic battle. The price of copper has gone up 300 per cent. We're out of trouble now. Thank you very much. I take very great pleasure in supporting Milton for this position. Does the member for Oxley accept the nomination? I accept the nomination. Is there any further proposal? I move that the honourable member for Fisher do take the chair of this House as Speaker. It is an absolute privilege to speak in favour of my fellow Queenslander and friend, the member for Fisher. The member for Fisher was originally from Victoria. He was born in Melbourne. But like many, he made the right decision to move to Queensland, where he and Leone have raised their daughters. And he worked tirelessly, tirelessly with the community to make sure that they were very well supported. Now, having visited his electorate many times, I've seen firsthand how very well regarded he is by a broad cross section of the community. And I've been delighted to be able to work with him to secure additional funding from the proceeds of crime for the Daniel Morecambe Foundation on the Sunshine Coast. Now, he's been a big supporter and an advocate for Bruce and Denise Morecambe, and they continue to work diligently to ensure children are safer in Australia. The member for Fisher is an incredible example of a broadly experienced parliamentarian. He was a carpenter and a joiner builder before becoming a barrister. And of course, he's a husband, a father, and he did all of that prior to becoming the elected representative for Fisher. He is exactly the sort of person who makes our parliament richer with the experience he brings to it. In his maiden speech, the member for Fisher made reference to the kind of society that he believes in, and which I'm sure members of all political persuasions would relate to and agree with, when he stated, and I quote, it is testament to our Australian egalitarian way of life that a once carpenter and the son of a motor mechanic and fabric importer can come to serve the community in this place. In Australia, there are no class structures. There are no hereditary entitlements to sit in this place. There are business people, farmers, bankers, tradesmen, unionists and labourers, among many others, who are privileged to take their seats in this chamber. 
I would urge the new members of parliament, particularly those new independent members on the crossbench, to consider his experience as a previous Speaker of the House. This is, in a sense, the very first test of your independence. You don't have to vote for the government. You can make your own decision. You can consider the candidates on their merits. Now, having done the job admirably, the member for Fisher is clearly, clearly the best qualified candidate. Having done the job, he's very well placed to deliver the kind of impartial guidance that the House needs going forward. Consider also his years of service across multiple parliamentary committees, including as chair of the House Standing Committee on Infrastructure, Transport and Cities, chair of the House Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs, chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, chair of the Defence Subcommittee of the Joint Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade. Now, finally, in nominating the member for Fisher in November last year, my colleague, the member for Barara, made a number of observations, including that the member for Fisher is very much his own person and that he is a deep thinker and a true parliamentarian. And I agree. He is a thoroughly decent individual and exactly the sort of person who epitomises the qualities of a true respectful and observant speaker in the traditional mould. He served the last parliament with grace and fairness. If we are to make this 47th parliament more productive and collegiate, surely we should be electing the best person for the job in this vital role. It is with great pleasure that I nominate the member for Fisher to take the chair of this House as Speaker. Is the motion seconded? The member for Ford. Um, I'm honoured today to, and delighted to uh, second the nomination for the Speakership for the member for Fisher to continue to serve in this House in the role of Speaker. Following the retirement from the Speaker's Chair by the member for Casey in November last year, the member for Fisher has served as Speaker for the remainder of the 46th Parliament with dignity and respect. The working relationship between the parliamentary office holders and the Speaker is quite unique in this place. And as Chief Government Whip throughout the 46th Parliament, I had the privilege of working closely with the member for Fisher during his time as Speaker. In order to ensure the smooth running of any given sitting day, communication and working with the Speaker's office is paramount, and we always enjoyed a very close working relationship. I know the work that the member for Fisher puts into the role is second to none and can attest to his incredible knowledge and passion for our nation's parliamentary processes. This has been demonstrated time and again during his decision-making process while in the chair and I've always found them to be clear, concise and rational. He take, when he took on the role of Speaker, the member for Fisher was conscious of the need for the chair to be an independent and fair voice within the chamber. And I believe he has gone above and beyond the expectations placed on him and that for the member for, for Fisher should be very proud of the job that he did in the 46th Parliament. The member executed his responsibilities fairly and constructively acting with tremendous reverence for the traditions and processes of our parliamentary system. Through thinking through the problems as they arose rationally and calmly, the member for Fisher was fastidious in his approach to the role, utilising his extensive knowledge gained through two years of service on the Speaker's panel prior to his appointment as Speaker. His time on the panel allowed the member for Fisher to develop a comprehensive knowledge of the standing orders, which he demonstrated time and again as Speaker. A person of the highest calibre, the member for Fisher is conducting himself in a manner befitting the office through a continued period of disruption brought on by the pandemic. And taking up this mantle from the member for Casey was no easy task, as we all readily acknowledge. The ability of our parliament to operate irrespective of the conditions placed, faced by the nation was continuously challenged 
with our presiding officers responsible for implementing the measures which would allow this to happen in an appropriate manner. The member for Fisher was up to the challenge and performed admirably serving the parliament with distinction. With the presiding officers once again being called upon to manage the operation of parliament through a period of strain and uncertainty, I can think of no better person to entrust in this pivotal role for our democracy than the member for Fisher. For many people who know the member for Fisher, these attributes will come as no surprise. Prior to taking on the role of speaker, the member gained the necessary experience and qualifications by successfully undertaking roles uh, in various committees right across this parliament. As a fellow Queenslander, I can first hand attest to the manner in which the member for Fisher takes care of his electorate and advocates for his local communities in this place. The people of Fisher have a tremendous advocate in their local member and I hope this place can continue to benefit from his judgment as chair. The 47th parliament will come together during a pivotal, pivotal time for our country. The challenges are many, both foreign and domestic. It is imperative that the Speaker who oversees the business of the House during this time takes on the role with impartiality embodying the rich tradition of the office and this place. I know the member will continue to serve the Parliament and people of Australia well and judiciously and conscientiously as he did throughout the 46th term. As a man of great conviction, I am proud to call him a friend and colleague. And as the member for Moncrief so eloquently put it in endorsing the member for Fisher's initial nomination during the last parliament, he is simply a great bloke. It's with immense pleasure that I second this nomination for the member for Fisher to the office of chair. Does the member for Fisher accept the nomination? Is there any further proposal? The time for proposals has expired. The bells will be rung in, in, and in accordance with Standing Order 11, a ballot taken.
The doors will not be locked. Ballot papers will now be distributed. Will honourable members please write on the ballot paper the name of the candidate for whom they wish to vote? The candidates are Mr Dick and Mr Wallace.
result of the ballot is Mr Dick 92 votes and Mr Wallace 56 votes. Mr Dick is declared elected as Speaker. I wish to express my grateful thanks for the high honour the House has been pleased to confer upon me. And I call the Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, congratulations. Uh, the fact that you have received such an overwhelming majority is a credit to your standing in this place. It's a credit to your standing professionally, but it's also a credit to who you are, your integrity as a human being. I was very pleased when I heard that you were interested in running for the position of Speaker, uh, because I believe that this House uh, needs to be treated with respect. Uh, this is a debating chamber, by definition, and it's one in which we should have open free and frank discussion, but do it in a courteous way wherever possible. It's one in which uh, ideas are exchanged in the interests of the people who send us here, and we should always remember that. Uh, you are someone who has always conducted yourself uh, with extraordinarily, extraordinary propriety and conducted yourself in a way in which uh, you engage with people across the chamber across our caucus, uh, across the cross benches, I note uh, the very fine words by the member for Kennedy in support of your nomination, uh, shows, I think, with the result of the ballot as well, that you've been able uh, to already show, even some new members, uh, that you will be someone who brings great dignity to the office. Uh, to the former speaker, I thank you for uh, your speakership. Uh, it was very difficult following on from uh, the former member for Casey, uh, who's in the chamber here today, who I believe was an absolutely outstanding speaker and, uh, and conducted himself uh, with incredible dignity in what, what was often uh, a very difficult time, particularly during the pandemic as well, where uh, the rules in terms of, uh, of the way that this parliament conducts itself uh, were set aside on a bipartisan basis just so that we could continue to function as a liberal democracy, uh, which is so important. Uh, to you, Mr Speaker, I am absolutely convinced that, that you will be outstanding as well. Uh, there is no doubt that you are someone who is honest. Uh, you are someone who has uh, been a friend of mine for some period of time now. And you are someone as well who has been a wise counsel to myself as leader of the opposition in my former position. I thank you for the support that you gave me to hold that high office and have that great honour of leading the Australian Labor Party and throughout what was a difficult last term, uh, provide counsel as uh, part of uh, the group of people uh, who would engage uh, across uh, the caucus and be a bit of a sounding board uh, for people. Uh, one of the things I've noticed about you is that people uh, will come uh, to you for, for assistance and guidance, and that's something that uh, a speaker needs to do. Uh, the office needs to be open for any member of parliament. There are, I forget how many new members there are here, 30, 35 new members here. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr Speaker, already showing your capacity. <laughs> For me, Mr Speaker, 76 was the only number I was focused on, <laughs> and, uh, and we got 77. I thank the member for Gilmore for that. Um, but going forward, uh, 
new members in particular. Um, you know, I encouraged them when I got here, um, being a, a, a dork of parliamentary and political processes. I actually read the standing orders before I got here, read House of Reps practice. Uh, the rule book does matter in terms of getting things done. It's not just a matter of pedantic being pedantic. I know that from time to time there have even been criticisms passed in this place that people are, are too concerned about parliamentary processes. Uh, that's how rules are made. That's how, <laughs> indeed, that is, that is how laws are made in this country, and it is important uh, that uh, this parliament operate in a way that brings pride uh, to people. In many countries of the world, uh, people stand in front of tanks to try to get the right to vote. In Ukraine at the moment, uh, the people of Ukraine are standing up against an autocratic regime uh, which is engaged in a brutal and illegal invasion. They are standing up for uh, democracy in Ukraine. Uh, for us here in this parliament, we should be very proud that we had an election on May 21 and we had the swearing in of a new government at 9am on the Monday morning. And uh, I was able to represent Australia at the Quad Leaders meeting with the Foreign Minister. That brings credit to our system as a whole, that you can have a seamless, orderly transition of power uh, in a de democratic country. Uh, that's important. It's important that we respect, though, the fact that uh, we didn't elect uh, just uh, one party. We elected a range of people to this House and to the Senate, and uh, those views need to be able to be heard and heard in a way which uh, produces better outcomes. And your role is to ensure that that happens as well in an orderly way. So I congratulate you very much, Mr Speaker. I look forward uh, to working with you and I look forward to, uh, to uh, your, your rulings and deliberations being absolutely fair and, uh, and, and correct, as I'm sure uh, they will be. It's a great honour to be Speaker of the House of Representatives. Well done. Thank the Prime Minister. And I give the call to the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, on behalf of the Opposition, I extend to you very sincere congratulations. And uh, of course, it wasn't difficult. Uh, you're a fellow Broncos supporter. Uh, so as a Queenslander, it's great to see you in the chair. I want to pay tribute to uh, the member for Fisher for his time in the chair. He was uh, following in the footsteps uh, of a giant in this place, uh, the member for Casey, who I acknowledge in the chamber here today. The member for Fisher was able to conduct himself uh, in an equally honourable manner. He is a person who, uh, like the Prime Minister and many others who hold the traditions of this chamber close to their heart, uh, he was able to exercise his rulings and uh, his practice in this chamber uh, on that basis. Uh, I want to, Mr Speaker, um, say to you that there are uh, many people that, uh, who know you well, and I uh, am very pleased uh, to have seen you in action in your own electorate uh, in the recent Queensland floods, uh, where I visited as uh, the then Minister for Defence with uh, some of the troops who were helping on the ground, and the empathy that you demonstrated toward your constituents, uh, the respect with which uh, uh, they responded to you, the engagement when we went into the community centre, uh, it was obvious that on the ground uh, you had uh, a great deal of kudos and uh, that is a great credit to you and I know that you will bring those qualities into uh, this job also. It is an incredibly important role that you take up as the 32nd Speaker in this 47th Parliament and I pay tribute uh, to, uh, to your uh, predecessors as I say but the standard now has been set by the member for Casey and we uh, expect big things of you. The uh, first Labor Speaker, Charles MacDonald, was chosen uh, uh, in this House of Representatives. Uh, Bob, you weren't here then. Uh, I know you interject like you were, but, and it was touch and go, but 1910 you were not here. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, Speaker MacDonald said, and I quote, I intend to act with absolute fairness to all parties and trust that I shall perform the duties appertaining to my office and recognise the responsibilities attached to it in a way which will do credit to the chamber, to the parliament and to Australia. And I know that you will follow uh, in 
that spirit, uh, as you take this high office, on behalf of the coalition, I extend to you uh, congratulations and every success in this role. I call the Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, congratulations. Uh, I've known you since we met in, in Young Labor in our early 20s in the early 1990s. Uh, and it's a, a great honour for you to now be in this role. I want to thank the member for Fisher. Uh, people often don't know, in the lead up to parliament sitting, before we've elected a speaker, the previous speaker continues to hold the office. And a lot of arrangements and a lot of work has gone into today uh, being organised. And as the presiding officer, the member for Fisher has been responsible for that. And I want to, uh, on, on behalf of the government as well, just express thanks for the way that that was done. Uh, I also want to thank the member for Casey, uh, or the former member for Casey, sorry, uh, who put you on the speakers panel. Uh, and it was possibly a difficult thing to put you on the speakers panel, and I should confess to the parliament that was my fault. Uh, there are photographs circulating on social media of you turning up in the chamber, Mr. Speaker, uh, with toy Muppet dolls. Um, and you were thrown out of parliament for that, uh, and it was entirely my idea. Uh, that you do that, and you were chosen on the basis that at that point you were the only member of the caucus who had not yet been thrown out. Um, so while it was disorder, it was disorder on the basis that you, to that point, for an opposition, had been too respectful of the system. Uh, I want to wish you well. Uh, you've done a great job on the speakers panel, but importantly, this job doesn't end when the parliament adjourns. Uh, there is a lot, particularly with respect to the Raising the Standard report from Kate Jenkins, there is a lot that will be required to be done in terms of here as a workplace where the role of the presiding officers is going to be critical. One of your great skills, which has caused you to be supported by so many members today, is you are someone who brings people together. You are someone who reaches out to people, and when people have had their toughest days, it's often a phone call from you that comes, and I think that augurs well in terms of the role, not simply in presiding over the debate, but in managing this building as a workplace. I wish you well. Thank the Leader. Uh, I call the Manager of Opposition Business. Well, uh, thank you and uh, congratulations, Mr Speaker. I join with the Prime Minister, the Leader of the House and the Leader of the Opposition uh, in extending uh, congratulations to you and certainly on behalf of the uh, opposition, the Liberal and National Parties, we warmly congratulate you. We acknowledge your experience and aptitude for the role. Uh, you've been in the parliament since 2016. You've served on the speakers panel. And I know from my discussions with you that you have a clear understanding of the importance of the role uh, and the significance of the responsibilities that you now hold. Um, I do want to, as other speakers have done, uh, acknowledge uh, former speakers uh, Smith and Wallace who have set, I think, a very high bar. Um, while we're acknowledging people, I'd also like to acknowledge the member for uh, McEwen, who served the last parliament uh, as second yeah, deputy yeah. speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, uh, this is a very important position that you've been uh, elected to, and I know you are very cognisant of the need to deal with all members of this chamber with fairness and impartiality, uh, following the high standards set by previous speakers. Uh, the opposition looks to you confidently to uphold these values uh, and the responsibility that comes with the position to uh, engage with all members, uh, government, opposition, crossbench, uh, and work with them constructively and professionally. Certainly our commitment to you, Mr Speaker, is that we will work with you uh, professionally and respectfully. We'll, of course, uh, always put our position clearly and make our case strongly, but we will always respect the fundamental importance of the role of the speaker. Um, yours is a role which is vital to this institution, this embodiment of our democracy, the Parliament of Australia. And ultimately, as the Prime Minister and others have mentioned, community confidence in our system of government depends very heavily on what happens in this place and very much in the uh, way that the speaker operates. Uh, so the opposition uh, warmly uh, congratulates you, uh, wishes you the very best as you discharge your heavy responsibilities, and we pledge to work with you uh, in that objective, uh, as with others in this House, 
of maintaining community confidence in our system of government. I thank the Manager of Opposition Business. I call the uh, Leader of the Australian Greens. Thank you, Speaker. On behalf of the Greens, can I also extend my congratulations to you on your election to this critical role and also uh, join in thanking, on behalf of the Greens, the service of former speakers. Um, Mr Speaker, it's customary for speakers, when they enter the chamber and take the role, to nod to the right and nod to the left, but perhaps in this parliament more than any other so far, there's also going to be a case for looking down the middle. Um, we've just come from an election where, roughly speaking, a third of the country voted for the government, a third voted for the opposition and a third voted for other voices. And you see that represented in part here on the crossbench. And I think in part that was a reflection of a desire probably across the political spectrum from people for not only a higher standard of debate in this place but also for the capacity for uh, the ability to debate issues that previously hadn't been put on the agenda. And I trust Order. that there are also matters that are um, important to the whole parliament as we go forwards. And on behalf of the Greens, again, congratulations and we wish you well and you have our support in this role. I thank the Leader of the Greens. I seek the indulgence of the House to respond to the gracious remarks made by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition and other members of the House. I start by thanking the House for the enormous privilege in taking this office. Today, becoming the 32nd Speaker of the House and following my friend the member for Fisher and a former Speaker in the chamber today, Tony Smith, is a day that they know I'll never forget. Speakers are supposed to be dragged to the chair due to fear. It's a tradition I understand and I'm feeling quite a bit of fear right now. <laughs> but when you were dragged to the chair by people of the calibre of the members for Macquarie and the members for Bendigo, two of the strongest women I've met in my life, fear is the last thing I think of when I think of them. The member for Macquarie is a woman of warmth, strength, resilience and integrity and particularly today the strength she's shown for nominating me here today. The member for Bendigo was a warrior, fiercely loyal, always protesting and always standing up for what she believes in. And I don't just thank them for nominating me today with their words, I thank them for their friendship, kindness and belief in me. I have many friends in this place, literally all over the chamber. Some might say too many on the left, some might say too many on the right. I want to recognise people like the member for Bonner, who was an old family friend, the members for Capricornia and the members for Wright, and alongside my old mate, the member for Treasurer, the Minister for Aged Care and the member for Blair, with the Leader of the Opposition, it's a Queensland unity ticket. Well, at least for three nights of the year when the origin is on Surrey PM. But to the Prime Minister, thank you for your friendship and support. The Prime Minister has never waved in his belief in this House and its power to make the lives of ordinary Australians better. These are the values I know that every member of the House will strive to uphold. This morning, I learned something that we both share in common. Our late mums both believed in good manners. To the Leader of the Opposition and the Manager of Opposition, opposition business, I congratulate you on your new roles. You have my respect and I know you will give it your best and I wish you well. To the Deputy Prime Minister, through good and bad, you've stood there always encouraging. I value your counsel and friendship. And to the Leader of the House, I met you around 30 years ago, that's correct. And I always knew you would be a leader in this place, though I never thought I'd be sitting in this place, let alone in this high office. Your encouragement and belief in me to enter this house in 2016 is something I'll cher cherish and never forget, but don't expect an easy ride. <laughs> to the member for Kennedy, I appreciate your very kind words and acknowledgement of our hometown connection. I look forward, I think, to your robust contributions <laughs> to this house. But as a time like today, it is a time for reflection and a reflection on my own life and my own family, and I reflect on my great-grandparents. They came with nothing but their faith and their belief in their children succeeding if they got a fair go, back in the 1860s from Scotland. 
Joseph Park Allen's descendants, my great-grandfather, are in the chamber today. My sister and some of my cousins, all strong, fearless women. In his, in his memoir, J.P. Allen talks about leaving Scotland to come to Australia, and he says, Needless to say, we're all very excited having at last made a start for this wonderful country we had heard so much about. And when he arrived in Queensland, he reflected on his experience, saying, I've often wondered since how we stood such a severe test. Two lads, just 10 and 12, just fresh from a cold climate, dumped into the hottest part of North Queensland summer and to travel through the mountain ranges and dense scrub from Port Douglas to Charters Towers. They often say they breed them tough in Queensland, and that's my background. And unfortunately, my brother cannot be here today as his obligations are with another house, more specifically the Queensland budget estimate process, which he is loving at the moment. <laughs> I'm enormously proud of him, but even prouder of my sister Susan in the gallery, a teacher for over 34 years and someone who passionately believes in the transformational nature of education. But that's my story, and we all have a story about why we are here and what we want to achieve. But this chamber should be a place of ideas and energy, and I want to fo allow debate to flow with the very best ideas to be exchanged in a respectful manner. It's probably fair to say every speaker has said these words of some way or another over the years. But the difference is the people of Australia have sent a very clear message on how they expect politics to be conducted. They want something different. And I'm keen to work with every member to see that change, but I need every member to commit to that change to make it work. And I also want to improve on civics education and awareness in this country. Every school across the country should be able to participate in a schools and parliament program. And I want to help make sure that this parliament is more inclusive and open to Australians of all walks of life. And of course, one of the most pressing matters before this parliament is making sure that this place and building is a safe workplace and every person who works here feels safe and is safe. In the last parliament, we saw the Jenkins Review highlight the ways that this building has failed to keep its occupants safe. However, it also presented a roadmap to, a roadmap to ensure that we protect the people that we are responsible for. I take my responsibilities as a presiding officer in implementing the recommendations of this report very seriously. And I look forward to working with the Senate President and the incoming Deputy Speaker and all members to address this and other matters. I want to welcome the 35 new members of this House. As you know, you're only one of about 1,200 people ever to been elected. One bit of advice, cherish every moment, make every day count. To the crossbench, I'm looking forward to working with you no member of this House is simply red, blue, green or a mixture of blue and green. Some of you belong to parties, some of you are independent. But to me, as Speaker, you are all members of the House of Representatives, elected by your constituents to represent their interests. My message to every member in this place is simple. My door is open. I've indicated I'll be stepping away and not attending ALP caucus meetings, an important step that is befitting of my role and the importance of impartiality in this chair. In conclusion, I briefly thank many for assisting me to becoming Speaker. To the utterly professional staff in the department, including clerks and table officers, I thank you and I look forward to working with you. To my many friends and family that can't be here and to my wonderful electorate staff who have been such a support for me for, for many years, I thank you for your service to myself and to the people of Oxley. To my dearest and oldest friends, the Ministers for Communication and Social Services, you've literally been my, by my side my whole life and I can't wait to give you a hard time. <laughs> Honourable members, we are also privileged to be elected to this chamber. I resolve to do everything I can to fairly and uphold the standing orders. I want to make sure your voice is heard loudly, clearly and at all times fairly, with respect being shown through you to the people who have elected you without fear or favour. I thank the House. And I call the Prime Minister.
Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I have ascertained that it will be His Excellency the Governor General's pleasure to receive you, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the Members' Hall immediately after the resumption of the sitting at 2:40 p.m. Prior to my presentation to His Excellency this afternoon, the bells will ring for five minutes so that the honourable members may attend the chamber and accompany me to the Members' Hall. The sitting is suspended until 2.40 p.m.